and hello, and welcome back to the Global Energy Forum Day 3. I'm Atna Trainer. I'm delighted to welcome you all from around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a big good evening, really, in Asia. It's good afternoon here in the Middle East. Good morning, Europe. And uh, the US, they'll be slowly, well, no, they won't be waking up for a while. They've had a very, very busy day, a historic day, as, of course, I'm sure you enjoyed much of our coverage last night. We were really delighted that we were able to bring you so much analysis and so much in-depth coverage of um, the presidential inauguration and indeed all of the issues around it. So I hope you really enjoyed our coverage for the last few days and looking even yesterday where we really covered the energy transition in tremendous depth, looking all around the world in terms of what's going on, looking in Asia, looking at different countries, also looking at the technology employed and really pulling together. Also, of course, looking at the geopolitics of many regions of what's happening in the industry. And then I really coming together last night for uh, a, a close examination at one administration in the United States. So we have a very, very busy day, of course. And uh, so I think let's just get started and we'll keep you informed throughout the day. Stay in touch with us. We have the hashtags that's AC, so hashtag AC Energy Forum and also at AC Global Energy. So really, Stay connected with us and make sure that we hear your mind. And of course, questions for all of our panelists. Once again, we have a lineup of, of experts from around the world in the energy sector waiting here to engage Atlantic Council 2021. So thanks again for being with us. I'm going to hand over now to the um, Managing Director of and Resources from the Eurasia Fellow, the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council as well. So a very now to Robert Johnson for this first panel. Robert. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to uh, join everyone here this morning. Indeed, we are up early here in Washington, D.C. and on the East Coast of the United States, but happy to do so for our friends at the Atlantic Council and look forward to a great discussion this morning. Uh, the topic for our first panel uh, is the 2021 oil market outlook, boom or bust. 2020 was a very volatile year, as we all know, certainly in the markets with COVID, with geopolitics, of course, the election, uh, and we look forward to delving into what we can expect uh, in 2021. We have a great panel of speakers here, uh, but before we move to the panel, uh, we do have a keynote address, uh, and we're quite honored this morning to be joined by the Minister of Mines and Hydrocarbons for Equatorial Guinea, uh, and that is His Excellency, Mr. Gabriel Mbaga Obiang Lima. So Minister, we're looking forward to your comments. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Johnson. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I first of all would like to start uh, wishing everybody a happy new year 2021. This is probably one of my first uh, sessions or conference, and now all the conferences are virtual that I'm going and participating for this year. I also want to uh, be able to send a message to a lot of the people who are watching us that are at this moment at the lockdown because of COVID 19. I would like them to be patient and to protect themselves and their family. I also want to thank Atlantic Council for inviting me one more time to represent Equatorial Guinea at this forum. And at the same time, it's a great pleasure for me to be representing the African continent at this session. And I will first of all start like I ended last year. I did mention that 2020 and 2021 definitely were going to be a lost years. When I said that it was going to be a loss year, I meant that it was a year for soul searching, a year of transformation, because it was going to be difficult to be a business as usual. But what I did say last year, and I'm insisting this year, is that 2022 is going to be the recovering year. Now, regarding the topic of the session today, it is about the oil market 2021, oil market boom or bust. I would like to say that my view is that it's going to be both. It's going to be also a, a boom and it's going to be a pause. So why I say that, and I say this with the perspective of myself, the minister, the Republic of Equatorial Guinea as a small revenue, highly dependent oil and gas, a small oil and gas country. So this is our view as a small producer. I am not speaking on the view of majors or any big producer, but ours, the smallest one that definitely had been for many years uh, advantaging from these resources, but now had been hampered because of the oil price. Now, I mentioned it before that it's going to be paused because of two reasons. First, I believe that it's going to be a pause because it's going to be a still be difficult for all of the small producers. First of all, we know that revenue is going to continue 
dropping. And this is gonna be mainly because a lot of our fears are age and mature fears. At the same time, we have a lot of assets that have not been maintained for almost two years. And this has not been maintained mainly because of cutting of budgets. But at the same time, a key aspect, and this is the drilling. The number of drilling in small producing countries, even African countries, have reduced drastically. And that has a direct impact of our production. Because even though our production are declining, have nothing to do only about geology, has to do about the, the rate of drilling that have uh, drastically, in this case, dropped. The other key reason is that the key companies who used to work in small countries like ours in Equatorial Guinea, in our area also in the Gulf of Guinea, were small independents. And a lot of those companies are either fleeing, disappearing, or even consolidating. So they are having more difficult for them to be able to work. And at the same time, the majors who have been working also in our countries are actually more picky in investing in specific assets that they believe that they are more strategic and they provide them more liquidity. Now, that's clearly the negative part. The positive part that I think is going to be positive, and this is going to be the opportunity for the boom, are going to be especially what we all have been witness yesterday on the peaceful, peaceful transition of a new administrations in Washington, D.C. My view and our view of some small countries is that we do believe that that administration, are go it's not really a very good friend of Shell. It's not really a good friend of our, our, our industry, but clearly it's, it's going to be supporting us. But at the same time, it's not going to be business as usual, especially in the U.S. And a lot of people are aware that clearly some of our biggest issue has been the rapid growth of the shell industry in the United States that have really hindered on the full volatility of our, our, our industry. The other issue, of course, is going to be that projects are not going to move as faster as it used to go before and regarding getting green light by the government, especially because of the new executive order, like joining back into the Paris Accord, some new environmental decision, especially in the US, not a worldwide. So definitely investors are going to be looking for new places to invest, places where their investment are going to be moving quicker. So I do believe that a lot of those investors are going to be starting looking back into the conventional or either new places other than the US. So that's, again, an opportunity for small country like, like us. Of course, the other issue is that uh, we do believe that this new administration are going to be more international engaged. So that's going to be having an effect on the massive vaccination and at the same time, on more synchronization of economies worldwide. So definitely it's going to be allowing that a lot of economy worldwide are going to be increasing. That's going to be having an impact because for that increase to happen, we definitely know that our resources are going to be needed. Now, it's not going to be needed for from now to five years. Definitely for this year and next year, it will be needed for kickstarting. But at the same time, we are definitely very conscious that uh, the energy transition are going to be moving faster with all the new uh, administration executive orders in the importance of reducing the investment on fossil fuels and moving into more, um, more less contaminated uh, resources. But I do believe that our resources are going to be extremely necessary for the kickstart of a lot of the economies that they will need it to be able to, to go back into the post uh, pre-COVID. Now, of course, uh, the, the final conclusion is that uh, the, the, the light is being seen at the end of the tunnel. And we do see that uh, things are going to get much better in 2021. There is more vaccinations. We are seeing a lot of majors and small independent consolidating. So definitely they're going to be going into drilling. But of course, there is another challenge that countries like us and host countries are going to be having. One of them is local content. Clearly, COVID have destroyed a lot of jobs, not only in oil and gas, but a lot of jobs in other sectors. So job creating is going to be very important for us. So any oil and gas industry work that is going to be created, it will require that we do focus on local content and participation in job creating, not just job, job keeping. The other issue that is going to be challenged also is ownership of assets. Definitely a lot of countries and NOCs are going to be thinking of actually taking charge of their asset, being able to be more in control in their destiny, because definitely that situation of having to depend of international market, having to depend of oil markets and the depending of, on the rest is not really well taken by all of us. And, and definitely that's going to be looking at 
very hard on us how we can definitely take charge of our own industry. So again, I want to conclude thanking the Atlantic Council. I want to say that uh, I'm, I'm a very appreciative for always inviting me. I definitely will have loved to be in Abu Dhabi. I do enjoy to do that. And hopefully next year, I will be able to join you, not by virtual, but by like we always done in Abu Dhabi. And again, I want to end one more time, uh, thanking everybody and asking everybody who is in lockdown, again, to be patient and take care of the family because we are about to go um, to, to, to end with this pandemic that have affected and take the life of many people uh, worldwide. With this, I want to thank you and I wish you a very successful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Uh, those are very insightful comments and it's very viable for us to hear the perspective uh, of the African producers and the smaller producers, uh, which are gonna play a critical role uh, in this oil market recovery and going forward. So thank you for your time today. Um, we appreciate your comments. <clears throat> Let me now turn to our panel session. Uh, I'd like to introduce my, my fellow panelists here who are spread across the continents. Uh, from uh, just beginning uh, with Dean Foreman, who's here with me in Washington, DC, and he's the chief economist uh, for the American Petroleum Institute. Then we have uh, Ms. Toril Bozani, who's uh, the uh, oil markets editor uh, and, and head of the oil markets division at the International Energy Agency, I believe in Paris, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Chris Midgley, who's the global head of analytics for S&P Platts, uh, calling from London. Uh, and then Alex Booth, who's the head of research for Kepler, uh, a great a great firm. Uh, and Alex, where are you? I'm not sure where you actually are located today. Uh, based in London. Okay, so, so also based in London. Uh, and then last but not least, we have uh, Carol Nakla, who I believe is joining us from... The Black Forest in Germany. The Black Forest in Germany. Okay, and you're the CEO of Crystal Energy. So we're very happy to have you here and also a fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, so we should have a great uh, discussion this morning. And what I thought I'd do uh, is kind of divide our, our sessions here into uh, starting with the demand outlook for oil uh, and asking everyone for their views uh, on different aspects of what's happened the demand side, and then uh, turn things back over um, to uh, to the to the supply side. So, Alex, I thought I'd start with you. Uh, your company is known from a great view of what's happening uh, in inventories and in flows. Um, so why don't you set the scene for us? Where do you think we are in 2021 after after you know an incredible uh, oil market roller coaster in 2020, especially in the second quarter when we had that that big stock build, floating storage build up? How do things look like as of as of now here in January 2021? Yeah, uh, thanks, Friday. Um it I think, yeah, we, we really have to set the scene through what happened last year if we're going to try and work out what's going to happen through through the remainder of this year. It's quite right. Um, just to kind of run through some numbers from the first half of last year, um, we built about 356 million barrels on sh in onshore inventories from, say, the end of January through to the end of June. That was the peak. So you're looking about a 10% increase um, peaking at 3 million, sorry, 3.7 3, uh, 3 billion barrels, just over 3.7 billion barrels in storage. Um, where we've gone from there, we have declined. So through to the end of the year, uh, we drew about 130 million barrels, taking us to just over 3.6. Um, now, that is also obviously a very, very high level. Um, but we have managed to kind of stave off adding more to those to those peaks over that time frame. So um, a, a lot has been done through the second half of last year in order to kind of to keep a lid on those inventories. So if we look at, say, what happened on floating storage as well, because kind of the inventories piece isn't just on the onshore stories when there's a lot of pressure in the pressure in the system. We look at what's happening offshore as well. Um, and you saw a kind of a, a build of about 125 million barrels again in the first half of the year that drew down um, through the second half. So it's kind of that pretty much cleared off the water to, to end the year at about where it started around the 90 million barrels levels, pretty, pretty a long running. Uh, long running average, to be honest. So if we want to know what's going to happen through into this year, we need to say, okay, right, well, where is that available storage left? And ultimately, we kind of have to return back to China. It was one of the, the saviors for absorbing barrels through last year. Um, and it's still, we still see it having capacity to absorb more barrels from this point now as well. So I think there's about 250 or so, 245 million barrels of working capacity left in non-SPR facilities. So that's more the commercial facilities. Um, 
And when we were looking at this earlier in the year, that was it was going to be very hard to access all of that storage because you had a small number of locations with a decent quantity of storage left. Um, but then a lot of installations with like half a million barrels, a million barrels here and there, which would have been very hard to fill logistically. That's kind of evened out a bit more. So we think that the Chinese system can absorb more barrels if needed. The question is, are they needed? I think ultimately the heavy lifting has really been done, and we'll kind of address this later, I'm sure, the heavy lifting has really been done by OPEC Plus and the cuts that they made. So they made significant changes to their exports um, through, uh, through the second half of last year. Um, and we went from about 28, uh, so 31 million barrels a day, say in March, down to uh, about 28 million barrels a day in December. So they've done a lot to address uh, the oversupply in the market, and we've seen the kind of the, as they've stated with these month, the, the kind of the intention for monthly meetings, they're going to be kind of increasing the supply as they see that demand coming back. So they, that's really where we are for uh, for this year, a much more balanced position, but very high inventory still. Yeah, very 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 high inventories relative to the to the five year averages. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, so Chris mentioned that. Let me turn to you. Uh, let's talk about COVID. Um, and I, I was thinking is also talking about crude inventories and floating storage, but product inventories as well, right? Chris, what are you seeing in terms of the, of the COVID recovery, uh, in terms of kind of the sector view, the regional view, what's happening, you know, in, in, in transportation, uh, in other sources of demand? And, and what are you seeing, you know, Asia versus, you know, East of Suez versus West of Suez? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, RJ, and thanks uh, to Atlantic Council for having us. And I, I hope the new normal will be next year. We'll all be back in Abu Dhabi together, and uh, hopefully the Atlantic Council will schedule some sleep into the agenda. Um, but you know, I think you know what we're going through. I think at the start of of, of this year is that 2020 was really refusing to concede to 2021, it seemed to be mirroring the politics, and um, you know, it was a case of an increase of infections, new strains, uh, new set of lockdowns really starting to impose themselves very much as we had in 2020. On the other hand, I think last week um, and the last few weeks, we might have been able to argue that are we entering into a commodities super cycle? Um, we were seeing things like JKM up at almost $40 per mm BTU. We saw crude sort of looking like it wanted to head to $60. Um, we have grains uh, and sugar prices up at high new high levels, iron ore all at high levels. And, and why was that? Well, um, one of the key reasons was weather. Um, we had extremely cold weather um, that was impacting the market, which was driving the gas prices up, driving some of the oil demand up. And so one of the things I always say is be careful. Weather makes a fool of us all when we're trying to do our demand forecasts. And certainly that has been a key factor. But I think there has been some salient things in the background that we should look at. Indeed, Asia demand has been strong. Asia has recovered above 2019 levels already. And what is driving that? Well, first of all, we had some fiscal stimulus uh, in China to, that helped last year. And that's going to run out of some steam. We need to watch out and be careful there. But what is going strong is industrial activity is high. The PMIs look strong. India is doing well. Industry is returning. Um, we've seen construction activity high. That's the reason why we're seeing iron ore and steel strong. It's also why we see petrochemicals strong, strong de demand for things like styrene, PVC, which goes into the structure industry. You know, so petrochemicals has been up three, four percent last year, will be up this year. So I think some interesting signs there. We also see trade has been strong. You know, despite the virus, we're still moving a lot of goods. We're all still buying our widgets and having them delivered. And we see freight, the container market strong. So there are a whole load of signals there that could argue that we're moving into a commodity super cycle and things are good. But let's come back to the virus. The virus and the pandemic is still a drag. And we're now starting to see as we move away from that cold spell that started the year, prices are normalizing. They're starting to move back. And as we move into day one of the new presidency, day three um, of the Atlantic Council, you can see some different challenges. The positives, fiscal stimulus is likely to be coming, which should uh, give momentum to the US economy. Um, we 
have some signs of growth. But on the other hand, we see a lot of the talk has been about the green policies, which could challenge fossil fuels. And of course, COVID continues to be a real challenge in the short term, which is why we've seen OPEC cutting production in order to balance um, the market. So I think right now, when we look at it, the outlook that we have for 2021 is that demand will still be two and a half million barrels a day below um, the 2019 levels and will not recover till 2022. And that is all due to transportation. Passenger transportation, passenger cars, working from home, less aviation, more tra travel routes being cut now, Af South Africa, Brazil, Portugal, new strains, all of that is gonna be the big drag. So the story is strong demand in Asia, weak recovery in the West, Europe and US not recovering to above 2019 levels till next year. And it's a story of light ends, petrochemical feeds strong, fuel oil into freight strong, but transport fuels, gas oil and gasoline remains are really weak. Last comment, aviation. One of the interesting facts there is 13% um, of passengers account for almost 70% of aviation travel. What does that mean? It's business travel that really drives aviation demand. And if business really changes its behaviors, we could see aviation take a long time to recover. Our view, 2026 before aviation jet demand recovers to 2019 levels. So lingering drag there. Let me stop there. Thanks, RJ. Thank you, Chris. And I think uh, everyone in this panel probably is among that 13% that accounts for the 7% of travel, at least you and I for sure. But uh, Indeed. so Dean, let me let me turn to you. Uh, both of us are here in Washington, DC. Um, you know, uh, Alex and Chris have given us a bit of a global perspective. What, what's the view in the US market, right? Along with China, still the big, biggest crude market. How is demand coming back here uh, post COVID or, or in this, as we get to, hopefully towards end of COVID? You know, it really has. And RJ, Atlantic Council, thanks so much for inviting me to the session today. I, you know, API is a primary source of data. We survey up to 90% of the industry from a U.S. petroleum demand perspective you know, every week. So we've got supply, demand, trade inventories of crude oil, natural gas, liquids, and every major refined product. I think Chris said it great in terms of the way the expected recovery has been happening. Uh, a lot of the indicators, we've seen these building up, spooling up from a US side for several months. What is worth noting is that there has been a rotation on the fuel side. While we're down on net um, and transportation fuels are still down you know, in the last week or so, if you were comparing year to year, you'd say diesel uh, and gasoline both down by double, low double digit percentages. But on the propylene and propane and naphtha and gas oil going to refining and petrochemicals, those are up by double digit percentages as well, offsetting it almost half of if you took the total net declines on the transportation side, about half of that's offset just by the increase on the petrochemical side and refining side there. So that's one thing. And then the trade side, Chris mentioned this as well, but you know, you're getting another million barrels per day between you know, 600,000 barrels per day year on year of lower net imports on the product side and another 400,000 barrels per day up on, on the product export side. So point one is that U.S. refineries in this environment are continuing to remain globally competitive. Now let's turn to the activity level for refineries and, and talk about that for a sec. This last week, we went back above 15 million barrels per day of input into crude distillation units. So that's you know, one strong activity indicator. That's 82% capacity utilization. It doesn't get us back to the record 2019 levels, but it's at least back to where we were in mid-March last year, right before the onset of COVID-19. And, you know, I think the profitability side, refining margin side reinforces the same, that we've made a lot of progress. We saw the refining margins all but evaporate through the second part of the third quarter. Um, if we look out the window today, it's around $9 a barrel from a U.S. Gulf Coast WTI 321 crack. That's it's still around the lowest fifth or 20th percentile if you're going back over a decade, but it's progress and we've got to take stock of that. So while we're coming back on the demand side, we're looking from an activity level, something that's globally competitive, continuing to hang in there. There is some profitability that's there. It's just not back to the record levels that we ha that we enjoyed back in 2019. Great, thank you, Dean. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Turul Basani, let me turn to you. Um, 
interested to hear the IEA's perspective here. And again, we're fortunate to have so many of the leading uh, forecasters on, on this panel this morning. But uh, Terrell, I wanted to ask you about um, something Chris said, right, about this jet fuel demand maybe not recovering to 2026. But when we think about these uh, struck changes that we've seen because of COVID, you know, is, does I have a view on, on how much of this is structural and long-term and, and, and maybe things won't go back to the way they were in, in mobility or aviation or, or other forms of, uh, of oil demand? What is, what is the view on, on how many of these changes could be more structural long-term? Thank you, RJ. Uh, yes, it's something that we're looking very uh, much in detail into right now. It is the big question. Of course, COVID has created more disruptions to how we live, how we work, how we travel in over this, this period, this short period of time than we ever see. And the question is how much of it will be structural and how much um, will, how fast we will go back to normal. We do believe as the IEA that um, we will recover as the economy recovers, as all demand recovers, um, as the pandemic becomes comes under control, a lot of the things will go back to the way it used to be. But some of the changes uh, we believe um, are structural and we change the way um, we work, we travel. Many of us will continue to work from home, uh, not permanently, um, but on an occasional basis. Uh, business travel, I agree very much with Chris's view that uh, with uh, the successful, the, the virtual conferences that we're seeing, the fear of travel uh, to, for to um, to um, for health reasons and with cost cutting from companies, it is likely that a big portion of the business travel will be replaced by meetings and conferences such as this one. We find at the IEA that we're actually able to participate in more events and and reach out to to greater number of people than we used to do before. So some of these changes. Uh, are likely to stay with us with for some time the same in terms of work patterns. Um, but it's difficult to judge the impact because it will depend on choices that have yet to be made. Um, so, but um, when we look at it, we're looking at it in the short term, the longer term, medium term and longer term. We looked at how much of road travel is taken up for gasoline demand, diesel demand, is accounted for by the, the commuting as in total travel. Um, and that depends on, on the country, of course, it might be higher in the US than it is in Europe and cities and in Asian countries. And then we looked at the portions, how big uh, of that, what share of that um, uh, category are able to work from home and looking at that. And then we have to make assessments on how many days people would choose to stay at home and what we see, if all the if all the people um, that are able to work from home do so on a five day basis, uh, which is not likely, but this is sort of the max case um, scenario, we can lose a million, million and a half um, barrels a day of oil demand. Um, of course, on the other side, the, the fear of going on um, public transport uh, has led to increased car use uh, in many areas. Uh, we're seeing other trends that will impact the, the transport demand. Uh, we see a preference for large SUVs continuing. There is a lot of, uh, there, there is a lot of noise about uh, electric vehicles sales, which are rising very strongly, but the sales of SUVs are rising even more strongly. So this is counting, this is countering some of the effects that we see on here. So, uh, we continue to look uh, and see what choices people will make after the pandemic. In our base case, we think that teleworking, working from home, uh, shared office space, the reduction in office space uh, from a company point of view will continue and stay with us. Exactly how much it will be is difficult to judge now. Uh, same thing on air travel. Um, as I said, um, we look at the proportion of air travel accounted for by business travel. Some of that will be lost. How much would it be 20%, 30%? Will those seats be filled up by leisure travels? Uh, of course, business travel doesn't only account for um, a big portion of, of the seats on, on, and the kilometers travel on the plane. It also represents the majority of the revenue. So how, how the airlines will decide to structure their uh, set up their flight schedule, um, that's something that we will see, but definitely longer term impacts um, on both aviation and, and road travel. 
Uh, in terms of um, uh, supply chains, we're seeing that the crisis in the heights of the, 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 the lockdowns uh, and the pandemic last year, we saw a lot of disruptions to supply chains, the procurement of critical materials, components, uh, and we think that um, this is something that companies and, and countries are looking at to diversify their sources of supply uh, longer term. Uh, in the oil market, for a long time, um, customers uh, and countries have seek to diversify have, um, their, their sources of crude oil and products um, for security reasons. We think that this is also likely to expand into other sectors. Uh, which, of course, would leave with it uh, maybe increased cost of supply uh, some, some, in some places, but also spur economic development in some of their areas where the manufacturing uh, will move to. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I think, I think you're painting a picture of, of uncertainty about some of these long-term structural changes. For, yes, for it, it will depend a lot uh, because it will depend on choices and we have yet to, uh, to make them. It also depends on, on the pandemic. Do we really get it? How fast are the vaccines going to be effective? Will we get the pandemic completely out of control? Would it linger into uh, with cases and, and picking up in, in countries and, and in places well into the year and in 2022 and beyond? Um, the, the choices of, of both the industry, companies, uh, and individuals um, will be the determinant factor, and, and it's hard to, to judge what um, those choices will be at the current time. And, and the, a lot of our models are built on individual consumer choices based on price, and now you have other factors like COVID and public yes. that, that factor okay. as well. Okay. So let, me now exactly. turn, let me turn to uh, Carol. I, I think, um, Carol, I wanted to ask you about uh, actually, going back to the comments of the minister from Equatorial Guinea, um, because he mentioned that you know the small petro states, right in Africa and elsewhere, uh, are, are facing challenges uh, with with revenue, um, but also with lack of investment uh, in in uh, you know their existing production and and drilling for for new resources as well. Um, are you concerned from a geopolitical perspective that that some of these fragile states, whether it's in Middle East or, or Africa, Latin America? may not make it, then we're going to have more put up on rest this year if oil prices stay low. Yeah, I mean, indeed, if you are an oil producer, wherever you are in the world, you ought to be concerned because of what happened uh, last year. But perhaps it helps to really try to categorize the various petro states because you have here a very wide spectrum. Some uh, are better placed than others. For example, if you look at Russia, Russia, I think, is much better placed than the rest of the OPEC plus uh, producers, simply because it did not just uh, provide some lip services to economic reforms in 2014 when Russia Prices crashed, plus combined with the sanctions that were imposed on it, they implemented some serious economic reforms that continue uh, to protect its economy from the decline in prices. Countries such as Brazil, they are not as dependent on oil uh, revenues and oil prices as, for example, other petrol states. In the GCC overall, I see them in a much better um, situation than, for example, their neighboring countries, uh, including Iraq and Iran. For example, you have uh, yes, you have a high dependence on all revenues, but you also have financial reserves accumulated that has helped them to, um, again, shield the crisis. Um, not ideally, we have to be careful, we're not talking here about an ideal situation, but compared to the worst uh, case scenario. And there are, of course, some countries that I wouldn't include really in my spectrum because for me, they, uh, they have gone um, uh, over the hill or beyond um, uh, the definition of fragility, and I would call them zombie states. And here I'm talking about Venezuela and Iran. And economically speaking, these countries should have collapsed long time ago, uh, but they, um, they managed to remain where they are today because of uh, geopolitical circumstances. So this allows me now to narrow down on my selection to more concerning petro states. And um, here the usual suspects come to mind. I'm thinking here about Iraq, about 
about Nigeria, about uh, Angola, for instance, just to name uh, but a few. I mean, if you think about Iraq, it's really um, uh, ironic and mind blowing, if I may say, that um, their export earnings more than 90%. In some years, they were almost 100% of their export earnings was coming from oil. So take most of that away and you can imagine what happens to the economy, especially that Iraq entered 2020 from a very weak position, economically and politically speaking. We saw the protest across the country. The political situation remains fragile. And over the last few years, Iraq has had its own um, share of additional instability with fighting ISIS. So they entered this crisis from a very weak position. Nigeria. Nigeria, they need, or even Angola, they need more than $100 uh, oil price to balance their budget. And um, again, if you look at Nigeria, um, it's also ironic that they entered a second recession within a very short period of time from recovering from another recession because of what happened with the price collapse in 2014. So these countries, and of course the list can be much longer, but I'm thinking about the, um, some of the key petro states and that are in a more or less fragile um, economic situation. They are of course uh, concerning, um, but the question whether they can um, you know, survive another price crash. I think they can survive. You see, again, I mentioned earlier Venezuela and Iran. Um, they managed, again, not ideal, but they didn't really uh, disappear overnight in systems like Iraq, political system in Iraq. I think they were built to resist um, at least the political instability that has uh, engulfed uh, the country for, uh, for a while now. But I don't think this should be the right question. The question should be whether they actually should survive another, uh, let's say, 2020 or a collapse in prices. And in my opinion, if they just wait to um, go through the crisis and then survive it, this would be a terrible uh, mistake and it will result in a massive human cost, let alone the economic cost. But the goal should be how can they use the crisis to implement much needed economic reforms and as well as a wider social and political agenda. And here I remain skeptical because if you look historically, uh, we can see usually that when you have a decline in prices, many of these countries rush to announce one economic reform after the other, only to lose sight or delay or simply turn a blind eye on those reforms as soon as we have a recovery in oil prices. So this is the risk today. But again, they can draw, drag on and on forever in the current circumstances. But unfortunately, this is far from being uh, the right uh, economic situation for these countries, nor their people to be in. Thank you. I, I, I think that's a great overview. And, and I know at Eurasia Group, uh, one of our top risks this year was very much along the lines of what you're saying and uh, would add Algeria to the list along with some of the countries that you, that you mentioned, a key issue going forward. Just a reminder to everybody that you can uh, ask us questions via the Atlantic Council Global Energy Forum app. And we've had a couple of questions come in that I'll, that I'll share with the panelists. So, so Chris, just building on the conversation here, uh, and turning to OPEC, um, you know, Alex mentioned the, the OPEC cuts that we've seen over 2020 and then the unilateral cut uh, from the Saudis um, last, last month, uh, or earlier this month, I should say. What, what was your take on, on the Saudi strategy? And then, then a question from, from the audience here as well. Um, do, you, do you have a view on, on whether uh, U.S. policy towards OPEC will be much different under Biden uh, versus what we saw from Trump? Well, great. Well, let, let's first uh, touch on the the Saudi cut. I mean, we heard this this week from His Excellency uh, Mohammed Bakinda that uh, it wasn't a unilateral uh, uh, cut, um, which I think is interesting, but also tells us a little bit something that there is a very strong level of negotiation that goes on within OPEC and OPEC Plus. And I think it very much was uh, Saudi uh, Arabia offering to do this extra cut, but in the condition that compliance. And as we've heard from Carol, the temptation is for all of them to start to weaken their compliance given their economic situation. And so it was very much a holding of OPEC together in order to keep that uh, group working effectively. The timing was excellent. 
The market was already a little bit strong. It had broken through $50. The back of the curve was still relatively weak. WTI below $50. Uh, Brent sort of at the $50 mark. So not at that level to stimulate new investment, not at a level to stimulate a new round of investment in Shell where we're seeing strong capital discipline. And as such, it was the right time to provide market support and reset the market instead of in the say 45, 50 range, perhaps in the 50 to 60 range. So the timing was good. It was also, I think, a strong signal to the new US administration that Saudi Arabia can play on the, on the, the big scene here, that they can influence um, and you know, they can perhaps provide market stability and they should be talked to and be part of discussions. And why do they want to be in discussions with the US and being brought back into why they're very much uh, have a vested interest in what happens in the nuclear discussions with Iran. Um, and right now, while Iran is not gonna come back onto the market, it's a time to tighten, keep things tight, keep prices up. And there is an economic benefit. We saw that the market moved probably around about $7 a barrel up from where it would have been. And if you take the million barrels a day cut and $7 more on the, the existing production, they're still generating more revenue as a consequence. So I think there was, it was a sensible strategy. It was well-timed. And I think it was a good signal to the US administration. And I think that comes to that, that question from the audience, which is what will Biden's role be? Um, I think he's got a lot of things on his uh, on his plate. COVID, um, he wants to look at around climate change, et cetera. So perhaps he'll be less focused on trying to influence OPEC, um, but I think he will be keen to continue with the Abraham Accord, bring you know, Saudi Arabia into the discussion and think about how he gets Iran back into the marketplace without destabilizing some of the you know, positive moves that have been going on. But he also, Iran's playing a very smart hand here. They're ratcheting up the tension to make it into a critical issue for him. So Iran is really going to be more of a focus for him than OPEC, given the way that Iran's playing their cards there. So I think he will let OPEC play the role. And right now, I think OPEC is doing an extremely good job at managing the market and keeping it balanced. As Alex says, you know, the stocks are there. They're not yet where they need to be. And Saudi Arabia realized that given the extra rounds of infections, the impact on demand, they needed to take strong action uh, for February, March. I think we're in a good place, uh, but still with headwinds, probably more headwinds right now, they need to keep that group working well together. Very good, Chris, thank you. <clears throat> Alex, let me turn, turn back to you uh, for the couple perspective. Uh, you know, a couple of people mentioned compliance, uh, and it, it certainly seems uh, for, from the outside observers that, that OPEC plus compliance has been extraordinarily high. Uh, over the last six months or so. Are you seeing anything different to data? Anything, any surprises or anything to watch for in 2021 on the compliance side? Yeah, I, I think um, for us at Kepler, certainly we, we need to be very careful around the word compliance um, and those that monitor it. Uh, we uh, look at what we kind of term market supply expectations. And ultimately, from our point of view, that's kind of what matters. It's what does the market think is going to be coming out of these countries with regards to um, the cut pledges and so on. It's, so we, we, we prefer to look at things like that. Um, I think, uh, as we've been saying earlier, a lot of work has been done. Um, the data through uh, for December uh, was very promising um, in terms of kind of uh, a lot of countries, in fact, the kind of the key stakeholders, say, in the Middle East and with Russia were kind of going above and beyond what was expected in terms of uh, reducing their output, reducing their supply to the market. That meant that, say, across the OPEC group, we saw about 93% of expectations, but there's still some work to be done. What we're seeing in January, though, is that there are cuts in um, exports that really are going to kind of flow into this. So we're seeing, okay, we're only two two thirds of the month, but numbers from Nigeria and Iraq are both showing cuts in exports, which are going to really help for them to kind of fall more into line with expectations. At the same time, we've got this kind of generally increasing demand. Okay, some kind of more headwinds are coming in as more uh, countries are going into lockdown and so on. Um, but 
generally we think uh, the group as a whole is really going to fall into line. Um, I think the fact that we're looking at this monthly uh, monthly meetings to reassess the situation is going to, going to be key going forwards um, because kind of with the latest IA report, we saw kind of another reduction in uh, demand expectations for the first half of the year. And we've just got to keep an eye on that. But the thing is, we can, we can see what's happening with product supply. We can see what's happening with uh, like distillate flows around the world and how they're being impacted by some of the short term uh, headwinds that we're seeing at the moment. So the information is out there, basically. Um, and so far, things are pointing to say so far for this for January, things are pointing in the right direction. Very good, thank you. So, Carol, let me turn back to you. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, some some of the geopolitical risk in the fragile states, and, and you mentioned Iran. And I, and I wanted to ask you a little bit more of your views on that, building what Chris mentioned uh, about what should we expect from Biden, uh, and is there a real chance for for a material return of Iranian oil exports later in 2021, early 2022? How do you see the geopolitics playing out there? We already have some indications from the Biden administration and its team that uh, President Biden would um, be more uh, welcoming in terms of re-engaging with Iran and probably reviving um, the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, because we know in 2018, President, uh, former President Trump not only withdrew from uh, the deal, but also imposed uh, unilaterally some sanctions that target various sectors in Iran, particularly um, the oil sector. And that's why we saw this massive dip in exports. Um, you know, we, we, we saw a loss of nearly or more than 2 million barrels a day and today barely we have a couple of hundred thousand barrels a day being exported only recently I would say uh, primarily to Asia but Iran has a big potential so even today despite the sanctions despite all the problems despite the halving of uh, production it remains the fifth uh, producer within OPEC and as such we cannot ignore what could happen with Iran, whether Iranian oil uh, is going to make it to the market if uh, the Biden administration goes ahead and um, uh, revives a nuclear deal with Iran. And um, so I can, if I look at what happened uh, after the JCPOA was signed in 2015, if you look at 2016, there was an impressive uh, ramp up in both production and export. So within, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in four months, we saw an increase of 700,000 barrels a day of Iranian exports hit the market. And within two years, Iranian production was back to almost the pre-sanctions level. So the potential is there. And the signals are that, yes, Iran will be um, uh, invited again for um, more comprehensive and mutually beneficial uh, negotiation. But here there is a big part. I mean, first of all, there is a timing. When will that happen? Um, I looked at various um, uh, publications and commentaries, including um, an interesting report published recently by the Atlantic Council, looking at the complexities, the legal and the political complexities uh, around the JCPOA. And, uh, um, there seems to be an overwhelming agreement that the JCPOA is not going to be renegotiated overnight. So there is the issue of timing. There will be some time for uh, Iran to fulfill the conditions uh, that will be required by the Biden administration. And also there is a presidential election in Iran taking place over the summer. But also for us and before this panel, the most important relevance in terms of timing would be uh, what is the status in the oil market when the Iranian barrels come back to the market. And here there is a big if but at the moment, I don't think the market is really concerned about the Iranian barrels coming back to the market. I wouldn't even look at it beyond, I mean, until um, I would consider it really beyond 2021 to make any substantial difference. And then it all depends on OPEC plus strategy. Of course, they will have to revisit it and accommodate that. And maybe um, Iran, which has been exempt from the uh, cuts, may be brought in depending on the dynamics then. But it's not something that I would be personally concerned about in the shorter term. Great, thanks, Carol. Uh, so, Trill, let me turn to you and, and building on that, uh, and also a question that came in from the audience. Um, what, what are the implications of all this for OPEC plus spare capacity? It's obviously, but once again, at very historically high levels. And then related to that is the question from the audience, which is, um, at some at some point, is, is there a risk here that we that these OPEC plus countries start to compete again for, for market share, especially vis-a-vis -vis China? Right, if China's where the demand growth is, the audience member's asking, you know, will we see uh, countries start to really chase that chase that market? Uh, you know, worrying that that might be the last uh, 
the last great uh, gasp of demand here. What's, what's your view on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so to start on the spare capacity and put the issue of, of Iran to the side, um, if we assume that the OPEC plus uh, deal stays in place throughout 2021, um, with a gradual tapering of the cuts in the second quarter. And if they were to stick to the agreement, um, the original agreement to, to withhold um, 5.8 million barrels a day uh, of oil from the market in the second half of the year, the spare capacity within OPEC uh, will decrease from 7 million barrels a day currently to six by the end of the year. Uh, we have some capacity building in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait as the neutral zone ramps up, uh, but little increases elsewhere. Um, and the, the countries uh, from non-OPEC, Russia and the other non-OPEC countries participating in the deal, their production will still be one and a half, two million barrels a day lower than it was um, before the supply cuts took effect last year. Now, we heard from the minister earlier that, of course, investment cuts uh, and, and drilling, softer drilling project delays it's not only restricted to, um, to, to none of the countries. The agreement. Uh, this would also affect uh, production levels in some of the OPEC plus countries. Um, we will see um, how much of an impact it would have in, in the decline rates over the year. This past year, uh, little incentive to, to invest in additional production capacity. So that is something that is playing in as well. But to say end of the year, uh, we're still sitting on um, seven, eight, nine million barrels a day of capacity without counting uh, Iran, of course, and assuming that uh, the, the production in Libya holds at the levels where they are now. But assuming, um, so the tapering of cuts will really depend on the demand outlook. Um, despite the weakness that we've seen in the first, that we expect to see in the first quarter that we're seeing currently, based due to the new lockdowns, new, new measures that are put in place in a number of countries, we do expect demand to continue to recover uh, over the course of 2021 as vaccines become more readily available, the economy continues to pick up. And, and this will depend, this will underpin uh, the need for OPEC plus to increase production. We heard a lot about the inventory situation. Inventories are very high still globally, although they're drawing down uh, quite um, sharply towards the end of, of the year and still into the first quarter. Um, but we're seeing um, if, if, the, if the OPEC plus countries were not to increase um, production in the second half, those stock draws would accelerate uh, very sharply and we would come down to the to the previous five year average or even below. So there is you know there is room there's clearly room for the OPEC plus countries during the second and half of the year as demand um, picks up more strongly to taper these cuts, um, their, um, their commitment to, to, to keep markets stabilized, to meet on a regular basis to assess it, we think that uh, that's what they will aim to do. Um, so once stock situation uh, normalizes somewhat, uh, the cuts will likely be tapered along with the demand. As for the, the incentives or, you know, the possibility that we would head back into a second um, su um, supply uh, war for um, market share war, um, I think that we saw uh, last year how, what, what happened. Of course, there is uh, temptations for the OPEC plus producer to increase output uh, to benefit from um, some of the rising prices and, and to boost their revenues. Um, but we think that they will uh, aim to maintain the, the, the deal and, and the solidity of, of the OPEC plus um, for some time to come. Thank you, Terrell. So Dean, you're gonna get the last word here. Uh, Terrell, Terrell mentioned the word temptation to chase revenue. And, and of course, shale CEOs would never think that way at all, I'm sure. And uh, I think they've had their own lessons about, uh, about what's happened in 2019 and 2018 as well, uh, as have the OPEC members and others. Um, so, so what is the view that you think on shale here? I mean, I think that's something that, especially this audience uh, in the GCC, uh, you know, in this forum, I think you're very interested in, right? What, what, what should we expect for shale, given all the dynamics we've discussed here uh, for 2021? 
cautiously optimistic. You know, and as I'm listening to the comments of my co-panelists here, it, we've got probably you know, on balance, if you're weighing this panel, you know, a slightly negative sentiment actually on oil and, and stressing just the razor's edge that the market's on and the importance of OPEC and balancing it. You know, I'm from a US perspective, we've got 19.6 million barrels per day last week of, of oil demand. That's, I mean, that's tremendous recovery and it's come back faster than maybe the global pace has. So I'm caught, if you're going to get quick barrels, the US and OPEC really are the only places you're going to go for that. And the shale patch is really the place that can respond the fastest. Um, well, I, I should put that in context. Within a month or two, we can see a pretty good change in activity and we have been seeing that. So while oil drilling, it's down year on year, about 60%, right? And even with that, that's been enough to sustain and stabilize U.S. production around 11 million barrels per day, plus another roughly 5 million barrels per day of natural gas liquids. And here we are, just since the end of November, we've seen oil drilling pick up by about 20%. So here we are, that's a move from you know, mid to high $40 per barrel range into the mid 50s now. In this world, and EIA's, the US Energy Information Administration's ex expectation for this year and next is roughly the status quo of mid 50s. If it stays there, you've got an activity level that then depends on how's the productivity, how's the infrastructure, how those trade relationships. The productivity hitting that across every major oil and gas basin by EIA estimates has hit record highs and it's been hovering, plateauing there. So that's good news. Now, some will say that's just sweet spots that you're drilling. You can't sustain that. We saw back in 2015, 16, where a lot of that did stick. On top of that, the activity as it's coming back, plus the productivity, the Permian Basin with new infrastructure over the last year has been very well poised to participate in that recovery. And we've seen some of that already showing up in those new export numbers that I mentioned to you earlier in the session. Capital availability remains a sector-wide issue and we have yet to see. That's one of the uncertainties going forward, but just expect that there's a wedge above the break-even prices that has to be achieved and sustained to sustain that activity. On the policy side for where the administration, the new administration is going, we saw yesterday the repeal of the environmental permit for Keystone XL. Uh, that affects the crude oil balance. We'll see longer term initiatives. The biggest one and the biggest uncertainty is whether there will be a ban of fracking on federal lands. Uh, API has a study on its website concerning that, and it's a big potential impact. So while I'm cautiously optimistic in the longer term, we have some real issues to address. Great. Well, Dean, thank you very much. Dean, Terrell, Chris, Alex, Carol. Uh, I think it's been a great discussion. Uh, so many issues to, uh, to consider for 2021. And again, I assure the colleagues uh, sentiment here that I hope we can do this in person in Abu Dhabi next year and not at four in the morning, although it's been fun. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's going to conclude this panel on the oil market outlook for 2021. Thank you very much to Atlantic Council for inviting me to moderate and thanks to all the panelists again. And I believe at this point, I'm going to toss it over to uh, Phil Merrill to go ahead with the next uh, part of the program uh, for the Global Energy Forum. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you very much, Robert, um, RJ, to you and your panel.